have to move our speaker a little bit here. So, um, first of all, it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I really appreciate all the people that uh, have come to our conference that's uh, grown over the years. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about failure of non-operative management of solid organ injury in children. Non-operative management has really become the standard of care in uh, pediatric trauma, and the success is really phenomenal. Um, we can manage about 95% of all patients non-operatively. What I'd like to talk to you about today is about that 5% that we are not successful in managing non-operatively. And we're going to break it down into the organ that fails. And so um, spleen uh, non-operative management fails about 4% of the time, liver 3% of the time, kidney 3% of the time, and pancreas about 18% of the time. And I'd like to talk about which children fail and why, and what are the complications. So um, one of the most common reasons that, uh, that non-operative management fails is actually due to, to a intestinal injury. And one of the, the arguments that was made for not managing patients non-operatively initially was that um, we would miss uh, intestinal injuries, that you'd have a patient who had a liver injury um, that also had a duodenal injury, and, and you wouldn't see it because you didn't operate on that patient. Well, CT scanning has improved, and there actually have been several um, studies looking at um, what happens if you don't operate on those patients and if there's a delay. And one of the, the nicest studies um, was uh, published by uh, Bob Layton, uh, who's in Oklahoma, and he looked at 212 uh, patients. This is a multi-center study. Um, they were divided into four groups, and uh, the patients that were operated on less than uh, six hours, six to 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours, and greater than 24 hours. And what they found was that yes, the, the patients who were operated on early were, were sicker patients, but there was actually no correlation between time to surgery and complication rate. And uh, there was, that the delay in picking up that solid organ injury actually uh, was not associated with an increased length, length of stay, morbidity, or mortality. And what they concluded is that appropriate observation and serial examination is totally fine um, for picking up these injuries. Um, you do not need to urgently explore patients when the diagnosis is in question. And they actually went on further to say actually physical examination is, is adequate. You don't have to repeat uh, uh, CT scans in order to pick these up. So let's start with uh, spleen. So the main problems with, with splenic injury and uh, non-operative management are listed here. Continued bleeding, delayed splenic bleeding, splenic artery pseudoaneurysm, and splenic infarction or abscess. Now, in the adult world, um, it's very common that if you have a splenic blush that you embolize that. And in the children, it's a lot more complicated. It's, it's this complicated. That's, that's how complicated it is. Um, <laughs> and I know that you can't see this, but we'll talk about it more in a minute. Um, there have been a, a nice study came out. It looked at 123 pediatric CT scans. It didn't look at patients, but just looked at the CT scans. And this was back in the, before the days they had angioembolization. And they, uh, the mean age of the group was about 10 and a half years, and the ISS was 17. And these were relatively sick patients. About 2% died, and a lot of them had, con, had additional injuries. The median uh, splenic injury grade was 3. And what they found is that about 6.5% of kids will have a splenic blush on CT. And blush, also known as contrast extravasation, um, was associated with a low initial hemoglobin. But there was no association between contrast extravasation and the need for splenectomy, no association with delayed splenic bleeding, mortality, length of stay, or the need for, uh, for transfusion. And basically, a contrast extravasation in a pediatric patient is not associated with a negative outcome. There have actually been a lot of studies published now. There's more than 11 studies looking at uh, either contrast extravasation or angioembolization. And um, the first study, um, I know the people that, uh, on the webcast can't see this, but uh, the Davies study um, looks at the significance. They looked at 123 patients. That's the one we talked about. Um, Vander uh, Vliez um, uh, looked at seven studies. And they had 72 patients who had angioembolization. And what they found was that there's not a strong evidence to suggest that angioembolization actually helps in pediatric traumas if you look at all comers. But there was a significant enough number of patients that failed non-operative management that they thought it might have some, some uh, worthwhileness. Um, Clowder um, looked at 107 patients. And four out of five patients that had contrast extravasation did not need intervention. Um, the, the next study. Um, this was interesting because they, they looked uh, at adolescents, 
So nobody really knows, you know, the exact difference between children and adolescents as far as is how to manage them. Pediatric centers manage them like kids. Adult centers manage them like small adults. Um, they uh, took 97 patients. They did lots of negative angiograms. And uh, what they found is that 13% um, of, of their patients um, failed despite having angioembolization. And uh, what they recommended is that kids 13 to 17 who have bleeding, that it be used as an adjunct. The, um, some of the other studies um, looking at, at angioembolization, the thing that's remarkable about them is how few patients, um, how little data there is, how few patients have actually undergone angioembolization to, uh, to make the case. The best study is the one at the bottom by Gross. It came out this year. And what they did was they just used angioembolization as an alternative to splenectomy. What they, what they found was that in patients that are failing observation, angioembolization is probably a good way to avoid splenectomy in those, in those patients. All right, re-bleeding. This is what everyone worries about, delayed splenic bleed. And um, there are a total of 14 cases of delayed splenic bleed in the pediatric literature. And I'll tell you that of those 14 cases, I think it's seven of them are probably delayed presentations and not actually delayed splenic bleeds. Most of them are boys. Um, the mean age is uh, 14 years. And if you look at the amount of time it took before that delayed splenic bleed took, uh, occurred, the average was about 10 days plus or minus seven. Now think about that for a second. AFSA guidelines say that you can stay in the hospital for injury grade plus, uh, plus one. And so um, most of these patients, the majority of these patients would have gone home before they had their delayed splenic bleed. And so in order to get half the patients, you'd have to change your, your, your hospitalization to 10 days. And, and that's ridiculous for most of these patients. They don't need to be in the hospital for 10 days. So how common is it? Well, um, a nice study by Davies um, looked at the incidents. And this is from the, the folks at Toronto. And the reason that they looked at it is important. They looked at it because they had a 15-year-old patient with a grade 4 splenic injury that came back 23 days later after the initial injury with a delayed splenic bleed that caused death. And so when they looked at it, they said, actually, this patient died, but we, um, we managed 303 patients safely, and so the incidence is 0.33%. Well, we're at a casino, and that's not the reason that this ace of spades here. It's because if you take a deck of cards and you're gonna figure out what the incidence of ace of spades are in the deck of cards, you're probably on average gonna pick it up on the 26th card. And you would therefore conclude that the incidence of ace of spades in a deck of 52 cards is one in 26. Well, I would actually argue that the incidence of delayed splenic bleed is probably half this, probably one in 600 patients and not one in 300 patients. Re-imaging. So, for a long time, there was a lot of interest in re-ultrasounding patients with splenic bleed because you might find something. And that's true. There are splenic artery pseudoaneurysms that do occur. If you look at them, about 5.5% of patients um, will, have, uh, will have pseudoaneurysms. Uh, most of these are high grade, grade 3, grade 4 injuries. Um, for the grade 3s, it's about 8% 8, 8 will develop pseudoaneurysms. And of the grade 4s, about 17% get pseudoaneurysms. Most of these pseudoaneurysms, of these 10, seven of them actually thrombosed spontaneously, two of them were prophylactically embolized, and one patient actually had a delayed bleed associated with the pseudoaneurysm. There are 16 studies in children looking at it. This is the study we just talked about. They um, observed nine, eight of them resolved, one delayed bleed. Uh, most of the rest of them went to angioembolization. The bottom line is, is that, that you can choose to do screening ultrasound and angioembolization in, in pseudoaneurysm, but the majority of them don't need it. All right. So in summary for the spleen, not all children with splenic blush need angioembolization, and the decision needs to be based on hemodynamics. Angioembolization should be reserved for salvage. Adolescents may, may benefit more than young patients. Delayed splenic bleeding is rare, and I would argue that it's probably on the order of 1 in 600 patients. And moreover, most of the delayed splits will not occur during the period of observation while they're in the hospital.
most patients who do develop um, splenic artery uh, pseudoaneurysms, um, those pseudoaneurysms will clot on their own. The risks of failure, um, grade four gives you a five-fold risk of failure. Grade five gives you a 58-fold 58 uh, 58 risk of failure. If you're at a general hospital, you're five times more likely to fail than at a pediatric hospital um, after you adjust for a AIS, ISS, and mechanism. Don't shoot me, it's a real study. It's not the first. And it's a current study, it's from 2012, I believe. All right, pediatric liver injury. This is a beauty from uh, two weeks ago. I think uh, Dr. Egan uh, probably gets palpitations looking at, at this one, because we just did this. Um, why do kids fail non-operative management of liver injury? Well, the most common reasons are shock, followed by peritonitis, intestinal bleeding, and then thirdly, persistent bleeding. Um, less common complications are late bleeding, large post-traumatic cyst of the liver, intrahepatic bile duct leaks from the main ducts, compartment syndrome, free air, especially after ERCP, and then there's actually a reported case of duodenal obstruction by hypertrophy of the left lobe of the liver. I love that one. I had to put that in there. So predicting failure, non-operative management. These are the things that are predictive. Hypotension at admission, transfusions, high-grade injuries, grade four and grade five, not grade one through three. Higher ISS, Glasgow Coma Scale less than eight, multiple injuries, Hepatic artery embolization may be predictive. It is in adults. We don't know if it is in kids. We'll talk about that why in a minute. Peritonitis at the first exam predicts failure. Initial hemoglobin is less than 8.5, large hemoperitoneum. Not predictive are any of the low grades. So a grade three is not really much any more likely to fail than a grade one. And age, in the pediatric age group, age doesn't matter. In the adult age group, as you get older, 15, 16, 70, you're more likely to fail. But among the pediatric age groups, age is a non-factor. So I wanted to come tell you a lot about hepatic artery embolization, um, but the truth is that there are very few cases of it. Remember, only 3% of liver injuries fail in the first place. There are actually only seven published cases of, of arterial, of hepatic artery embolization in children for acute bleeding. It is generally successful. And there are 15 cases of using um, our, uh, arterial embolization for delayed uh, cases of pseudoangiosum, and that certainly is much more common. So, um, should you re-image um, all patients with uh, uh, liver injuries? Well, only about 1.7% of patients with liver injuries are going to develop hepatic artery pseudoaneurysms. And almost all of them are associated with high-grade injury or grade 4 injuries. Matter of fact, about 27% of patients in this one study um, developed pseudoaneurysms, just looking at the grade 4s. One underwent uh, embolization, and two of them, uh, unfortunately, de uh, developed uh, hemorrhage requiring urgent treatment. So, what we can say about hepatic artery pseudoaneurysms is that they're rare, that life-threatening bleeding appears to be more common than it is with splenic uh, artery pseudoaneurysms. We can't make a high-level recommendation, and uh, the literature suggests that these, are, that, that these are certainly, you know, to be taken more seriously than we do the, uh, the splenic ones. Um, I'll just throw this in there quickly about adults. Um, adults with grade 4, 5, and 6 liver injuries um, have 91% uh, success without hepatic artery embolization. 3% um, success with, uh, an additional 3% will be successful with uh, the, the embolization. Overall, 6% failure. Even those patients who had hepatic artery embolization, a lot of those actually go on to have uh, uh, operations for additional reasons. So, um, there is a very high rate of success of non-operative management of liver injuries in children. Um, failure, when it occurs, generally occurs early. Uh, hepatic artery embolization is a predictor in adults. There are few cases of bleeding reported in, in, uh, in kids. Pseudoranges are often embolized. Um, ERCP, uh, uh, PTC, and CT uh, drainage are, the, are, uh, are useful for managing the majority of the complications. And a late re-bleeding does occur in high-grade high injuries only, maybe about 6% of high-grade in injuries. That's a lot of information. So I'm going to break it up a little bit and tell you a little story. This was a 12-year-old patient. Um, he was on a, an ATV about 250 miles west of uh, Phoenix. Um, he got separated from his ATV, and when he stood up, he vomited, passed blood for urethra, complained of flank pain, um, subsequently uh, was intubated at the scene and uh, got a helicopter for transport. He arrived to our hospital five hours post-injury. There was no family present. He was hypertensive and tachycardic. His right abdomen was firm. He had blood 
everywhere. Uh, blood from the urethra in his hemoglobin Q is 11. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the western United States, um, that blue arrow is Phoenix, and that red arrow is the middle of nowhere. <laughs> this is what the middle of nowhere looks like. Um, this is the China Wall, and if you have an ATV, it's a great place to go take your ATV and ride down it. It looks like a lot of fun. Um, unfortunately, this sometimes happens. This is his CT scan when he arrived. Um, what you'll notice on the right side um, is the remnants of, uh, of his uh, viable kidney, and all this gray stuff around it is blood. If you see the sagittal, you see this cute little mustache right here. That's what contrast extravasation looks like for a patient who is bleeding five hours post-injury and has managed to bleed a lot around it. I love the fact that the, uh, that the um, inferior vena cava is completely bowed off to the side here. These are the delayed images showing some contrast uh, uh, extravasation, probably a leak. Here it is in 3D for fun, right there. This is what it looks like on, hepatic, on a, a renal uh, uh, angiogram, and you see that same vessel right here um, uh, coming off there, still actively bleeding. Our interventional radiologist, Dr. Tobin and uh, company, dropped some nice little coils in there and were able to stop that bleeding. This is the CT scan that mom made me get six weeks post-injury. Um, <laughs> and the, uh, this artifact is the, uh, this artifact is the, or the coils, and you see a wedge-shaped defect there, but the majority of the kidney is still there and viable. So, non-operative management of renal trauma. Um, there are very few pro prospective studies in pediatric patients um, on uh, blunt, blunt renal injury. Mercy Children's uh, in Kansas City is doing one. Uh, we're a part of their study. Most series are small, on the order of about 10 patients. Only about 3% of patients that fail, and those that do fail, most of them fail for hemodynamic instability, persistent bleeding, UPJ, disruption, um, and then some will uh, fail for abscess and clot formation. Among the, among the grade four renal injuries, the more, most of them do not require any intervention. Those that, uh, that do um, often uh, go to the OR for hemodynamic instability. Um, in one study, a medial contrast on the initial CT scan was associated with failure. There are other studies that do not support that. Um, uh, delayed or persistent uh, hemorrhage is common. Sorry, delayed or persistent hemorrhage uh, is, is a common cause of failure. Um, symptomatic urinoma developed in about 17% of patients, and most of those were actually just managed um, with percutaneous stent uh, drainage. In the grade five injuries, these are completely shattered kidneys. These are the ones that are really messed up. Again, hemodynamic instability causes failure, persistent bleeding, um, major vascular injuries um, often results in nephrectomies one to 21 days after surgery. These are often not done uh, on the day of admission. Uh, progressive urinoma um, sometimes requires surgery, but often this, these can be drained, and then they can undergo delayed repair of the um, UPJ um, avulsion. Even in high-grade injuries, uh, grade 5 injuries, kidneys are salvaged the vast majority of the time, and uh, none of these children with non-operative management of grade 5 injuries ended up being hypertensive. Predict predictors of failure, absence of contrast material in the ipsilateral ureter, large separation of the upper and lower poles predict uh, failure, uh, multiple areas of, of, uh, of extravasation, transfusion, all predictive. Not predictive is the diameter of extravasation. Just because you have a big amount of uh, extravasation does not predict that that patient's going to fail. And the location in most of the studies don't, do not predict extravasation. Pancreas. I think we need to be asking different questions for pancreatic non-operative management. Um, I will tell you that blunt uh, pancreatic trauma uh, tends to require operative intervention much more than all the other solid organ injuries. The failure rate is, is about 26%. The most common complications are pancreatic fistula, pancreatitis, pancreatic pseudocyst, um, subphrenic collapses, uh, inadvertent removal of the drainage catheter and line, and line sepsis. The reason I, I question whether or not we should be talking about it as failure is that um, grade one and grade two injuries are fairly easy to, to manage non-operatively. Um, grade four and grade five injuries, as uh, was tucked on di by Dr. McKersey in the back, um, uh, generally require um, operative intervention. I don't think we should be trying to manage most of those non-operatively, and so that leaves the grade three injuries. Um, predictors of failure, grade, high ISS, multiple injuries and bowel injuries. It's going to be hard to manage a patient who has an, a duodenal injury without, uh, without, uh, without surgery. Uh, 
if, um, if you compare non-operative management to operative management, what you find is that the patients that are managed non-operatively are in the hospital longer. They have a longer time on TPN. They have more overall complications. After you control for both ISS and associated injury, they actually have eight times more complications and two weeks more of TPN versus the patients that are simply operated on. A nice uh, multi-center uh, uh, pediatric trauma center study that we participated in gathered 162 patients with grade two and three injuries. Um, and luckily, 57 of them underwent distal pancreatectomy, and 92% were managed non-operatively. If you compare them, the distal pancreatectomy group were quicker to feeds. <coughs> they both did well, but they were quicker to feeds eight days versus 15. There were no pseudocysts in the operative group were compared to 18 in the non-operative group. Fewer endoscopies were required. Um, they had fewer interventional radiology procedures. And basically, distal pancreatectomy uh, is superior to non-operative management for pancreatic duodenal injury. So don't, op don't operate on the patient if the duct is intact. Um, complications are more common in higher grade injury, three, four, and five. Um, if the pancreatic duct is disrupted, you should operate and you should probably consider laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy if you get the patient early enough. One word of caution, um, a CT scan showing a pancreatic transection does not mean that the duct is transected. Um, you really need to interrogate the duct. You can either do that with uh, ERCP or MRCP and uh, that should really guide your therapy. Um, Non-operative management of pancreatic injury is possible. Um, the failure rates and complications are high. Um, the uh, complications of non-operative management include the ones that we listed, pseudocyst, fistula, TPN, associated related uh, problems, and sepsis. Overall, what I'll tell you is that the rates of non-operative failure in children are very low. Uh, pancreas injury is certainly one of the most common reasons uh, that, that kids get operated on. Persistent bleeding, um, regardless of the, of the organ injured. Um, the lead, delayed bleeding is extremely rare in, in children. Um, high ISS and grade of injury uh, greater than four are predictive of failure. And if you have more than one organ injury, you're more likely to go to the operating room. One final comment, timing of non-operative failure. This is a great little study um, uh, by, published by Dr. Holmes. And basically what it showed is the, the, the median time to failure. So about 40% of patients uh, uh, have failed by two hours, 60% of pediatric patients fail by four, by four hours, and 75% of patients that are going to fail have failed by 12 hours. Thank you.